feel in some ways that the sermon has already been preached today, and that is a very good thing. Um, the power of the testimony is, is the power of the testimony. It's how, it's how it's always been. It's how we find in this story. Um, so thank you, Luke and Emma, for sharing, and worship team for leading us in such a beautiful way. Um, yes. So I am, I'm aware of our time, I just want you to know, but I do have some few things to share about the scripture. And um, <laughs> um, yeah, this is a very familiar story for most of us, the road to Emmaus. Um, it's one we love, you know, it's, it's, it kind of feels good. Um, but it, it just, it, become come to, it can become too familiar, where we think we know, you know, exactly what's happening, we don't hear it. In a new way, we just kind of hear the same old story we always hear, and we feel good about it. Um, but when I was reading it and preparing for today, I felt like I, I read it in a new way. I felt like God really got my attention and showed me um, some new things. Um, new things because it's, it's easier to be, become comfortable with the words of Jesus sometimes. Um, the life of Jesus is comforting. Um, when we look at his story in the scripture, we're comforted by this. But it's not always intended to make us comfortable. In fact, the Gospel of Luke is all about breaking these types of boundaries. Luke is about all about the divine human encounter, which makes a lot of us uncomfortable. Luke's narrative paints a picture of what God's invitation looks like when met with human freedom. So we have God's invitation and human freedom. We always have a choice to receive Jesus. So this road to Emmaus is an invitation for all of us to see Jesus anew and to look for him and to recognize him in places we don't expect to find him and to bear witness to him with boldness. The story illuminates the difference between seeing with our physical eyes and with our spiritual eyes. You'll remember that just before this passage, a couple of important things happened. The women had gone to the tomb looking for Jesus and they did not find them, find him. But then suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. When the men spoke and told them that Jesus had risen, they simply believed. Now, these men in dazzling clothes, they were angels. How many of us believe in angels? Good. How many of us have had encounters with angels? Awesome. So this story challenges us to remember that the world we live in is not just made up of what we can see with our physical eyes. It also contains the spiritual realm, which can only be seen with spiritual eyes. The only source of comfort and assurance for these women came from two angels who surprised them and even terrified them. Yet sometimes we must depend on what we can see with our spiritual eyes for the fulfillment of God's promise. I love how Jesus comes alongside the disciples here and how he interacts with them and just asking questions and dialoguing with them about the things that they were carrying, about the heart, about the concerns that were, that were heavy for them. Our community at the center is basing everything we do on the life of Jesus and the way he lives. And this means living in a way that's countercultural, that requires a lot of faith. But because we're modeling the way that we understand he lived while he was on earth, the good news is being spread by disciples who cannot help but share. There's no, it's not forced or coerced. It is the overflow of lives that are open to the interruptions of God, to what God is doing in the natural and the supernatural. The road to Emmaus is a beautiful illustration of how we should all practice evangelism, coming alongside people, meeting them where they are. In this passage, Jesus starts to explain himself, beginning with Moses and the prophets. He finds ways to talk to the people he meets, in a, given their context and their perspective, their experience. I also love how the story highlights Jesus' emphasis on the journey, because it is a journey. Psalm 84 says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Jesus' walk with the disciples on this road illustrates the dailiness of our lives. 
proclaimed in the lingering conversations that hold the hope we long for. The story is set in the midst of confusion and even despair, yet Jesus simply enters in, comes alongside, and begins walking, even slowly, with his disciples along the road. Such an accurate description of what he does for us all of the time. Even when we don't recognize him, he is there. And when we are ready to engage what he might want to say or show us, he meets us on our own terms. He begins speaking to us in a language that we can understand, in terms that have meaning to us. And then he's invited to stay for dinner, or to stay the night. And this is such a beautiful moment that I think has changed and reframed every meal that we could ever have. Because when Jesus sat with them and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave thanks, he was suggesting that every meal is a holy, a holy place, a holy set apart time where the presence of Jesus is made manifest. Because the very presence of Jesus is revealed in the breaking of the bread. Some traditions call would call that a sacrament. And the sacrament is just the visible and outward, um, an outward working of the divine grace that we all know to be true. So I believe that this is why prayer before meals is such a common practice. I get together regularly with a group of entrepreneurs here, women who have their own business, and um, none of them would consider themselves Christians. But every time we gather, they ask me to bless the meal. It's interesting, right? But what Jesus models here instructs us that any meal can be an opportunity to feast on his presence. So when my friends invite me to bless the food, Jesus is being proclaimed as the bread of life. Many of you know we have a long-standing Tuesday dinner. It is a place of hospitality and welcome, but also authenticity and challenge. It's our opportunity to create common ground to stand with others, to come alongside and really listen to what they have to say and how we can serve them or accompany them in their journey of faith. We believe part of that hospitality we offer is becoming a prepared people, ready and willing to receive Jesus and to invite the stranger and open to the possibility that God might use the stranger to speak to us. One of the themes throughout this book of Luke is this divine human encounter where Christ makes himself known by revelation. But as we see here, this often involves taking a risk being willing to see Jesus and acknowledge the Holy Spirit in action. But as typical of Jesus, he doesn't push himself on us. He allows us to choose him, to choose to see him, and to prepare ourselves to receive a deeper revelation. But sometimes we're not ready to receive his fullness. But shame on us if we're not always seeking this and seeking the fullness of his glory. Acts 1.8 says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But if we're not living as children of the resurrection, then we might be dead men walking. It's interesting also that Jesus appears to the disciples, not to the unbelievers. He must know how quickly you forget. I mean, wouldn't you think that just three days later... How easily that, you know, they wouldn't recognize him. But then I think about my own life, and I realize how quickly I lose sight of Jesus. But if we as disciples can't see and recognize him in our midst, how can we bring the hope of revival to the hearts of those still in doubt and despair? Before we help unbelievers to see the light, we must desire to see the fullness of Jesus with our own eyes be willing to be surprised. This is a message for all of us that our hearts may be open, that we would become a prepared people, willing and able to see Jesus in the natural and in the supernatural. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up and sort of play without words, that beautiful thing they do. 
Because I feel like a story and a message like this just requires some space um, for listening to what God might want to say to each of us individually or as a church. But so I'd like for them to just play a little bit and we will just spend some time in prayer, listening prayer. So Jesus, thank you that you are here just walking alongside of us, God, even if whether we're sitting or walking or playing, that you're just right next to us, God, that you are the incarnation. You are Emmanuel, God, with us. And forgive us that we forget that sometimes, that we get so caught up in just believing and knowing the right answers. That it, we, we don't allow ourselves to follow after you, to leave space to hear from you, to allow you to change the way we see. So, Lord, we bring, we bring, our, we bring our, our whole selves to you right now and ask that if there are scales on our eyes that they would fall away and that we would see you aright. So if we're struggling with any fear, any unforgiveness, Lord, allow us to see that other person just as you see them. Just broken and confused and just as messed up as we are. And Lord, if there's anything new that you want to show us today, I pray you would do that. Thank you, God, that you go before us in all we do and that you are our living hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.